Hi, everybody. My name is Nancy Moore with Africa Fire Mission. It's good to see you all again this week. And I think I see a few new names. So good to see you. Um, Africa Fire Mission volunteers are happy to provide this training for you. Uh, you are encouraged to share what you've learned and invite others to attend our weekly trainings. The training is provided free of charge, does not include a certificate of attendance at this time. The training will be recorded and when possible, the recordings will be available on AFM's YouTube channel for future viewing. Since this is a one hour training, we'll start with training and invite you to introduce yourselves as always in the chat um, using that feature in Zoom. Please do remember to mute yourselves, um, but you can also unmute yourselves if you have questions to ask. Uh, after the training, we will have a uh, short tea time hosted by our fire safety advocate, Jose, mm -hmm. who today or yesterday celebrated two years with Africa Fire Mission and Missions of Hope International. So excited about that. Um, hard to believe that he's been on board with us for two years. Amazing. Um, so uh, Ed is going to be completing the um, training today on uh, vehicle extrication and kind of this is part two, but if you missed part one, you can catch that on our YouTube channel. And uh, Jose is going to get us started this morning with some words of encouragement. Great. Thank you so much, Nancy. Truly appreciate. Uh, thanks, Ed, for uh, finding time to come again. Uh, and thank you, everyone across Kenya and uh, Africa at large. Um, today, um, we are going to I'm going to encourage us with, um, with a word from God. And um, I, I, I came across this uh, article and I felt, you know what, let me just share it with us because it's so re relevant to what we are doing. So the topic of uh, today's encouragement is says, use what God has given you. Use what God has given you. Yeah. And I'll read. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another, another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. That's in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24. Jesus taught his disciples to be distributors of his blessing and first responders to those in need. That's why he involved them in the process. He was equipping them to represent him in the future. In the feeding of 5,000, the miracle of multiplication did not take place when food left Christ's hand, but the disciples' hands. He blessed the five loaves and two fish, gave it to them, and then set out to do what seemed ridiculous, feeding, feeding a multitude with a boy's lunch. But as, as they did it, they experienced the miraculous. Why? Because when the Lord's blessing is upon what you have, you succeed in spite of the challenges and obstacles. God has given each of us something that others need. But sometimes we fail to recognize it or we doubt its worth. So we conclude, I don't have what it takes. You do, but it's, but it's in seed form. Jesus described it this way. First, the blade, then the head. After that, the full grain in the head. That is in Mark chapter 4, verse 28, the New King James Version. Um, God has deposited within you something he wants you to recognize, nurture, and use for his glory. When he blessed it, you'll be amazed at the and develop potential you've been running around with. This miracle began when a boy found an unmet, an unmet need and decided, these people are hungry and need to be fed. That also when the disciple discovered that Jesus could do what they had, even, even though it looked helplessly inadequate. The word for you today is, Use what God has given you. Well, that's really direct, dear firefighters and friends, that you use what God has given you. 
Yeah, and what God has given us is technology so that we can get to learn more uh, uh, from uh, instructors like Ed and, and more others like them who give their time freely. So that when Ed, for example, gives us that knowledge, we can also go to our communities and counties and go and impact people with the same knowledge. So I encourage you, don't feel inadequate, just feel powerful and know that God has entrusted you to, uh, to bring in the shields to his kingdom. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this awesome time that you've given us today, this Wednesday. Lord, we've been meeting through and through every Wednesday this year without fail. You've made it possible for us and we are grateful. Lord, help us to use what you've given us so that we can bring in the shields to, to your kingdom. And even as we protect your creation, oh God, give us the courage. Oh Lord, I ask you that today you may give us a good internet connection so that when instructor Ed gives us the knowledge that he has that you gave him, that Lord, we may use it for your, for your creation, your human beings, Lord. Lord, I thank you and I bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ed Collette, the time is yours now. Take us through, sir. Thank you, Jose. And with extrication, we'll be seeing a lot of the stuff that we're going to have to use what we're given in the best way possible. We'll be going through techniques that use heavy hydraulics to hand tools to everything in between. So it's important that we're able to know how to use everything that we are given. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. You're up. Okay, good. So we, where we left off yesterday, last week was a lot of the preparations. So what we're doing now, we'll be looking at the techniques that we can use while we're going in to do the extrications. And everything with extrication, like many incidents, we start with scene assessment at the time of dispatch. We know what time of day it is, so we know is it a busy time of day where there's a lot of traffic? Is it a location that we know there's a lot of accident? Is it a high speed area or road we're going to? Oftentimes we'll get an accident call and if it's in a parking lot of a store, we know everything's relatively low speed. So we're kind of not, we'll say, we're not preparing for a big incident when we go into that. Compared to when we get a call on our interstates with lots of heavy lorries, lots of high speed traffic, we're thinking we're going to have a potential for a heavy incident. So the location, time of day, the weather, you know, a lot of rain can cause you know, people to have more accidents during the rain. There's a potential they can go into ditches or culverts that are full of water, which changes up our entire rescue tactics. The number of vehicles and the number of victims. And I put the star by this. A lot of times what we get from our dispatch isn't necessarily as accurate as it could be. When we show up, we've seen two, two vehicle accidents actually end up being four vehicle accidents. So kind of use the number you get from dispatch when you roll out as your base to think, well, this is the, you know, this is the best case scenario and there's a potential for it to get worse from there. Apparatus placement is important when we come up to the scene of an accident. This kind of goes with, you know, my soapbox of driving safely is once we get there, we need to set it up so we can work safely. One of the main, one of the big things that are injuring and killing firefighters now in the U.S. is getting hit on the highway and on the roads. So we want to use our fire apparatus to block the traffic to protect us. You know, so like in this picture, you have it the fire apparatus is angled across several lanes. 
Now this does a couple things. If a vehicle hits, you know, ignores that there's a fire scene or accident scene, it's going to hit the truck as opposed to coming up and hitting the people that are working. Uh, this angle gives us a bigger, basically billboard to show people that, hey, something's going on here. By angling it away, you have one door, one set of doors that are away from traffic. So the firefighters in the back of the cab can get out on the, we'll say downstream traffic side. So they're not getting out into traffic. Unfortunately, the officer has to get out into traffic. So he just needs to be very cognizant of the traffic patterns and what's going on. So this is one important part as the officer and fire apparatus operator to make sure you position the apparatus to block the traffic, but also make sure we have easy access to our tools and if we need to pull hose lines for fire suppression in the accident. The big key is make a safe zone for us to work in. Normally we take up an extra lane of road than we need to just so we have that extra buffer of safety. Now we'll set out on here and we'll start and we'll have our working zone. Then we'll use our apparatus farther back to start blocking. Then we'll use cones to kind of start telling the traffic, hey, you need to get over and there's something going on here you need to be aware of. So that's this is kind of the setup we use when we try to push traffic away from our zones. And here, the cones that we use have reflective, so at night they can be seen. And we space these usually about 20, 25 feet apart. And we can, ideally, we go back as far as 300 feet to start our safety zone, or roughly 100 meters back to start traffic pushing away from our work zone. But we know often that's not practical. So we just try to get as long as area as we can to taper traffic away from our work zone. Um, it, this is, I, I've been close to getting hit a couple times, even at low speeds on working on the road. Just people are distracted. You know, it's all, it's kind of scary as you're going to an accident, you see people on their cell phones, talking on their cell phones, you know, chatting with fans and not actually looking at the people they're talking to and not, you know, focusing on the road, just kind of not focusing on the task at hand, which they should be, which is driving. So they're not going to pay attention when we're stopped in the middle of the road and trying to render aid to people that have gotten in an accident. So we just, the biggest thing too with this, look out for each other. Often we don't have the manpower to have someone just to be a lookout, but if you do, that's always a good thing to have. Um, a lot of times when we go back and we're getting ready to leave and we're picking up a co our cones to kind of break down, we actually have one person walking and one person watching them, just so we make sure you know that we don't get hit. Never, you know, walk with your back to the flow of traffic. That's one of the keys I've picked up over the years is always walk towards traffic because, you know, just act and operate like they're out to hit you. And just think that you have to be very defensive in your posture as far as when you're operating on the highway. A 360 view to try to figure of the accident scene is just as important in an accident as it is in a fire. So you can see all of the hazards like fuel spills, wires that are down, uh, dangerous cargoes that may be involved in lorries that have been involved in the accident, fluids from the cars, number of victims, where those victims are at, you know, survivability of the victim. But you know, the car on the upper right, there's not much survivability in that passenger compartment where it dropped all the way down across the concrete barrier. How many victims are there? You know, we can, one of the things we look for, are the windows intact or are they not intact? 
especially if the windshield is not intact. You know, we we discussed last week the window windshield's made to kind of stay together in an accident. But if there's a hole in the windshield, it's not intact. There's a possibility someone was ejected from the car. So there's a victim that's not in the vehicle that we need to look for. And that's just look around the vehicle, look under the vehicle, especially like in rollovers. Um, some people have been ejected and when the car came to arrest, it stopped on its, came to rest on its wheels, but there was a victim underneath it that was ejected from the rollover. So make sure you look everywhere for where victims are. One thing that always sets us as a high suspicion index is if we see a child seat in the car. If we see a child seat, even if there isn't a child in it, we're always wondering, is was was there supposed to be a child in here? You know, and talk to the occupants and see how many victims you have and you know, just try to make sure no one's missed. One thing is at night that we will use is a thermal imager if it's available to scan the area to see if we could potentially see victims that are have been ejected from the car. We need to make sure we have the right PPE. Whenever we're doing our extrications, we're in full fire gear. Since there is the possibility that there could be a fl flash fire, we wanna have that protection. Um, safety glasses, leather gloves, high visibility vests and helmets. This is kind of our minimum safety standard when we're on the highway and on the roads, you know, especially that vest gives people you stand out and you can be seen more. So safety glasses and gloves, that's just protecting us. And you'll see when we go through some of these evolutions, the helmets, um, there, there's when we look at the tunneling, I will actually end up losing my helmet when we do evolutions like this, just because sometimes you can't fit. So now th this is the fun part. This is what people want to do and get the hands on. It's kind of difficult to teach from this angle since it's a very hands-on methodology driven um, and situational driven uh, topic. But we'll go through the tactics the best we can. Try to ask some questions and we'll get to, I've lost my chat, but we'll get to as many as we can. So, you know, just, Okay, one of the deciding factors on your tactics, it will be the number of victims, the level of entrapment, um, the severity of the injuries. You know, if someone just has some pain and we just need to be careful getting them out of the car, you know, we can take our time, we can go through some of the, you know, more methodical tactics. If we have a patient that is in very critical condition, we probably will do some tactics that may be seen as taking some shortcuts. You know, we're going to do things that are quicker than we would if we had the time. So your patient condition is really going to drive a lot of your tactics. The orientation of the vehicle, you know, unfortunately cars don't always come to rest on their wheels in an accident. Sometimes they'll be on the side, sometimes they can be on their roof. Those are just things that will drive what we're going to be able to do. And finally, what resources do we have? You know, I, you know, we recently were talking that how fortunate we are that if something our, of our rescue equipment breaks, we can have another tool from another department probably within 10 minutes, which I know is, far different than what it is in Africa. So, you know, what are your resources availability? How long does it take to get them? I mean, that will, you know, that helps consider, will I be doing some advanced tactics or will I have to keep it as basic as I can for the time being? Quickest way to get to a patient is once the vehicle is stabilized, is see if the door will open. That's always the best thing on a tactic for extrication is try before you pry. 
just like with anything of forcible entry. Will the door just open? The other quick way, will a door on the other side open? That's for patient access. I don't, some people say, well, if the door's open on the other side, just take them out that door. I don't like dragging people across councils and everything else inside the car since you do not know potential injuries that they could have internally. So my, my thing is the opposite side door is a good way for us to get access to the patient, not a good way for the patient to go out. Uh, rear windows usually have a good area that you're able to pop in, have someone crawl through the back, assess the pacement, patient. Front window, they're a little more difficult to remove, but it's a quick way to get access to the patient. Pretty much any way that's safe for the rescuer to get into the vehicle once it's stabilized to assess the patient and the level of entrapment of that patient. A lot of times we won't be able to see what's entrapping the patient initially until we start digging in to the car. And remember, we're taking the car away from the patient, not the patient out of its car. So the level of consciousness, the degree of entrapment, number, level of injuries, and also if they are conscious and they seem like you know they have their wits about them, ask them how many people were in the car just to kind of make sure you didn't miss anyone. Now, if, they, if their level of consciousness is kind of questionable, take what they say with a grain of salt, but kind of keep it in the back of your mind. Um, lower level of injuries, we're not gonna be as rushed, we're gonna take our time, um, but heavy entrapment, heavy injuries, low level of consciousness, these are all things assessing the patient that you know we're going to drive how we get them out. Um, and also the level of care that EMS is going to be providing to those patients. Now, I know some of my friends that are paramedics have actually started advanced airways, IVs, all while the patient is in the car and we are working on extraction, extracting them. So this is where one of the places we're working with EMS is very critical to understand what they're going to be able to do and the types of help they're gonna need from you to do what they need to do, as well as them understanding what you're going to be doing as the fire department running the extrication. So we'll start out with a vehicle that comes to rest on its wheels and go through some of what we're going to do with that. The critical thing is stabilization. There's a whole, I did a whole class on lifting and stabilization back in December. Uh, you might want to go back through the, on the YouTube, YouTube and check some of that stuff out. But basically, we're doing stabilization for two reasons. To protect us and the patient from any additional injuries as the car moves. And also to give our tools a low path to the ground. So we're pushing against the ground as opposed to pushing against other parts of the car that may be weaker. One thing when we're doing stabilization on the wheels, a lot of people like to use these large step chocks. You can see how far out they stick and they can get in the way of things like when you move the doors and just general access. My personal preference is here on the left, just a couple pieces of cribbing wedged up under the, in this case, this is the extension of the A post. On the back, it's the extension of the C post in front of the front wheel. That gives you a stable platform. Do this on both sides of the car so the car's not resting on the suspension. The car is resting directly on the ground through the cribbing. Now, and you can see on this case, they used a step chock and actually we had to crib up the step chock since it was a bigger vehicle to actually get it to meet under the A post. Usually the biggest thing in extrication we're confronted with is opening the door. The fact that there is either a side impact or a front impact that has 
render the door unable to open by just using the handle um, because either metal has pinched around it or the actual mechanism is broken. Now, one trick that I learned before you try having to use the tools to extricate is sometimes if you take and can get inside the car with one hand and operate the outside door latch and inside door latch at the same time, sometimes that will release the locking mechanism and you can open the door that way. One thing to check too, if the door handle isn't working, make sure the car's not locked. Now that's just one thing to check. Maybe just quick glance, push the button, pull the button up to unlock the car and then the door will open up. So try to find the easiest method to open the door before we go into popping it with tools. Now, the first thing we want to do is before we're removing the door, you know, whether we're going to talk about some of the heavy hydraulics and some of the lighter tools as well, we want to get the glass. If it already hasn't broken out during the accident, we want to remove the glass and keep it outside the vehicle as opposed to pushing it in on the patient. This is why we cover up the patient with a blanket when we start to break glass. And don't just throw a blanket over the person's head. Tell them, you know, explain to them, we have to break the glass of your car. We're going to do this to protect you as soon as we're done. Breaking the glass will take the blanket off of you. You know, we want to let you know what's going on. And the whole thing, all the way through an extrication, if, if your patient's conscious, you always kind of want to be talking to them and telling them what's going on. They've just been in a very bad accident. Now they're hearing all these different sounds and other things breaking, and it can really increase their anxiety. But just try to be calming, and this is where EMS knowledge of what we're doing really helps out so that they can be talking to the patient and saying, hey, everything's okay. We're just taking the door off to be able to get you out easier. We're taking, the, we're taking the car away from you so you, we don't have to injure you any farther when we're taking you out of the car. You know, just give them a sense of reassurance as we're doing these things, you know, especially with the glass removal when we want to cover them up. One of the tricks I like to do is roll, if you can get to the uh, control to roll the window down, roll the window down till maybe you have, I don't know, 12 millimeters sticking up still. And then you can use a punch to break the glass or a tool to break the glass. When it shatters, it drops into the door. So it helps contain the glass as opposed to having it blow out all over your extrication scene where you'll be working. So to start, we need to find a place to start putting our tools into the door to get that spread open. So the first thing is use what the accident has given you. So as we see here on this car on the lower left, there's a large gap between the doors down here at the both, both bottoms I can easily use to insert my spreaders or start a saw cut to be able to open these doors. So use what the accident has already given you to just put your tools in. And this may need spread just a little bit, but you can use a pry tool to start spreading that. You can even use a pry tool to maybe help try pop the door. Now, remember there's two things with this, with the damage, we want to work with the direction the door swings. So the door swings out, we want to try to be pushing out, not pushing it towards the front of the car. And also watch how the metal is moving. So if we push out here, since we have this really pushed in section here, as we push out here, it'll that portion, the metal will push in towards the victim. So we want to try to be aware of how every move we make, what the reaction will be. So another way we can get a purchase point is put, if we're using spreaders or high lift jacks, so we can put the spreaders in the door 
and go from the base of the door up to the roof and then open our spreaders. And then that will buckle the door to give us a purchase point that we can start to spread the door open. Sometimes, depending upon the damage and the size of the spreaders, just using this maneuver to open a, for a purchase point will sometimes open roll the door off of the nader pin. Um, if this doesn't work, another thing we can do is set the ver spreaders vertically and drop them in the door and pinch them in the door to kind of pinch that skin of the door together. And then that'll pull out a little bit of uh, gap that we can use to start inserting our tools. So we'll first start, you know, if we're fortunate enough to have heavy hydraulic tools, these are our spreaders, the cutters that we talked about last week. Um, we just find a purchase point and then we just do little spreads until we make sure we have a good solid base to push against. Now here we kind of tunneled in a little bit at a time until you know, we talked about how all the corners are strong places. So right here we have a strong base of support on the frame of the car and this is a strong section of the door that we've gotten a hold of here and we can just spread this until it pulls off the nader pin and the nader pins right here. So what would happen if we can't if we can't get it spread all the way or the door starts to tear on us once we've exposed this pin you can go in with cutters and cut that pin. You can also use air tools and sawzalls to cut that as well if we don't have the cutters. So once we get the nader pin broken free from the door, then the door can swing open. The next thing we're going to do, sometimes we can push it open far enough that that's all we need to do to get the patient out. Sometimes we need the extra space that they'll need to take the door all the way off. So we can either spread the hinges off by setting the spreaders on the hinges and then opening them up to pop the hinge to break the hinges, or we can set the cutters into the hinge and use the cutters to cut the hinges. So as you can see here on the lower, lower left, this is a very simple hinge that's an L bracket that was very easy to cut. Some hinges have two levels of metal, so those will be a little more difficult to cut. Sometimes each hinge will take two cuts to move. Here we're using the spreaders. Uh, personally, I don't like using the spreaders to take off the hinges. It stores up a lot of hit energy that pops out and releases all at once. And like this, as you can see, we're taking, by taking the top hinge here first, the bottom hinge is in place, the door's rotating around that bottom hinge and actually picking the car off of our cribbing. So making it less stable. So th this is one reason it's just a more controlled maneuver to cut the hinges off instead of spreading them off. That's been my experience and just kind of my go-to uh, tactic to get the hinges. Now, if we don't have the heavy hydraulics and we might have light hydraulic tools or power tools, you know, what can we do to get the door off? Well, sometimes we'll start backwards. So with this car, the fender was already ripped off or we can use a saw and cut the, cut the fender away and that exposes the bolts that the hinges are on. We can use an impact wrench, a regular ratchet and wrenches that we can take the bolts out of the hinges and just remove it that way. You know, that's always an option. You know, remember these cars were put together with, you know, nuts and bolts in a lot of places. We can use that to our advantage and take them apart by hand if we don't have the heavy tools might take a little bit longer, but, or it could be just as fast. I think, sometimes I think the heavy hydraulic tools have spoiled us. 
and not making us think of some different ways that we can use to take cars apart that may be a little more um, expedient and efficient than just throwing the heavy hydraulics to it. And then to remove, to remove the doors, we talked about the high lift jacks last week a little bit. You can put high lift jacks into the corner by the in the corner of the doors and open the jacks up to spread the doors to actually open this up and hopefully pop the door. Um, at least hopefully give enough area so that we can cut the nader pin. Now, if we don't have the high lift jacks, you know the nader pins generally in this area, so we start cutting the skin of the door out to access the nader pin so we can cut either the nader pin itself or the door structure around the nader pin so the door panel will come out on its own. If we have air tools, we can actually cut the hinges, cut around the nader pin, cut the door, um, cut the door panels out, uh, probably will not be able to cut the nader pin with an air chisel, but there's a lot that we can cut around it to help remove that door from the nader pin. So it's just one of those things we have to be patient, take our times and think of how we can use, you know, use our tools. Like right, these types of hinges here, you know, I know this is a picture with a heavy hydraulics, but these are very easy to cut with um, an air chisel using either a half moon or a flat bit. Or if the bolts are exposed, you know, the most we're seeing is maybe three bolts in every hinge. That's very easy to take off with just a ratchet if that's what you have available to you. Um, when using the hand tool, the big, honestly, the biggest um, issue with using the hand tools to take off your hinges is finding the right size wrench to go on the bolts. So that we looked at the door and I'm a big proponent that if you have to take a door off to get a patient out and if they cannot walk out on their own after you take the door out, if you have to put them on a backboard or do any type of immobilization, that they don't just slide out, not just the doors coming off, the entire side of the vehicle is coming off. Uh, I've had some experiences looking back that we would have been able to give a little better patient care had we not had to move them around the B post to get them out on with the backboard or in our KEDS device. So if the patient needs immobilized, if there's any level or even a high suspicion of large injuries, the whole side of the car is coming off to make it easier to extract them. And when we do that, it takes the rear door, the B post, and the front door all as one unit. And if you practice this, and unfortunately, this is kind of a maneuver that's more geared towards heavy hydraulics, but if you practice this, you can take the entire side of the vehicle off to access, assess the patient in roughly 90 seconds. A good trained team can do it that quickly. Now it's gonna start, this maneuver starts very easily, just like you're popping the rear door. You know, you're gonna get a purchase point, you're gonna pop the rear door or get the rear door detached from the nader pin, and then you're going to swing it open. You'll The door will remain on the hinges. The next step, as you can see here, is we put a big cut as deep as we can in the bottom of the B post. That's the first cut we make is at the bottom of the B post. We want to make it as low as possible, below, we want to be below the door hinge, but we also want to make sure we miss, you know, we miss the um, seat buckle mechanism. If we get into the seat buckle mechanism, it will damage our cutters um, and damage our saw blades if we're just using a regular saw. So we want to make sure we go around this 
any bolts that are holding the seat belts in when we do our cuts, we want to make sure we miss those. Those are hardened steel and will damage our saw blades, our cutters, if we hit those. So once we make our cut down here, either with a sawzall or our heavy hydraulic cutters, then the next thing we're going to do is we'll put the tip of the spreaders below that cut against the rocker panel and against the door. So this cut here, we've got the very low cut. Now, the one thing I wanna point out on this cut, it's a bad technique. You know, we talk, we always wanna to try to make our cutters go 90 degrees to the material we're cutting. See how the blades have folded over and the material's kind of vertical between the blades and it's not the most uh, effective position for those blades to be cutting the material. Also, there's a potential to damage the cutters by spreading the blades apart and then the future cuts won't have the same power. With that cut made there, we will go ahead and spread the door and the B pillar apart from the car. Now, sometimes we can do this in one big push. Sometimes we need to make a push and get it part way out and then which gives us enough room to make a second cut on the B pillar. And then we can push it, spread it the rest of the way. These are just things you need to assess as you're making your spreads. If you can spread it with one, you can see if you still see metal that's holding on, you're gonna back out and either get the sawzall or the cutters in there to be able to remove the material that's holding you up. The last cut we'll make then is at the top of the B post. Now, it used to be they cut, the old tactics was we cut the top, then we cut the bottom, but kind of like the door and wanting to control it when we spread, if we cut the top and we spread the bottom, as the bottom goes out, the top will go in. And if it's cut free, this post is going right into the head of your patient. So we leave this intact until we have the bottom spread out. Then when we cut the top, we pull it away from the patient and away from the vehicle in one piece. So that's why we cut, the, cut and spread the bottom, cut the top last, so we don't push that B post into our patient's head. Then we pull the whole side of the car out as one piece and then take the hinges either by spreading or preferably cutting them. From the hinges on here, they're cutting the hinges off. Then that gives you a nice open area for patient access to be able to remove them from the car and you've successfully removed the car from around the patient. Now, sometimes, we'll get into accidents where the dash will actually push down onto the patient and they're pinning their legs into the car. What we'll need to do in this case is lift the dash structure, which in this case, here's the purple, shows all the structures of the dash. It's connected at the A posts here, it's connected to the firewall, and it's connected to the floor pan. So normally what we're going to do is we're gonna push one of these ends of this dash structure up to get rid of the entrapment. And hopefully all the plastics and you know, interior panels will come up with the structure as we lift it. But talking last week of how these cars are made as a unit to be uh, very strong and to try to protect the passenger as much as possible, it's difficult just to find a structure and push it straight up. We need to weaken the car. It's kind of like weakening the building for what we do for our RIT operations work with structure fires. So to weaken the car, to lift the dash up and to do what we call a dash lift, we need to make at least five cuts. We're going to cut the A post in two places and we do this so that when we lift the dash, 
the A post doesn't bind. You know, if there's a small gap we make when we make that cut, when we push up, it may rock back just enough that it jams up and then you're gonna be stuck up there, up at the A post. So we cut a section of the A post out so that there's, pl so there's plenty of room for that, for the front part of the A post to lift past the top portion. We wanna make these cuts. Remember, we're peeling all the interior panels so we miss any gas cylinders in here. So any existence of any gas cylinders for the airbag system will drive whether or not where we make one of our cuts. So we'll miss that, but we also wanna leave enough room here just in case this, this doesn't work and we have to put a ram here and push. We wanna make sure we give ourselves enough room up in this A post area that we can grab it with a ram. And we'll show that when we talk about dash rolls. This red structure, the front structure of the car, it's connected to the A post. And if we try to pick up the A post to move the dash from down here, this is going to be restricting us. So we go ahead and we cut this structure coming up. And this is a structure that is right next to your front struts, your front suspension components. We'll make two full cuts. And this one will usually use a V cut. Yeah, I find it, you can do a double cut like you did at the A-post, but I always use a V-cut. It does the same thing. It gives you a bigger gap so you're not binding your cut. And when I do it, I don't, I don't only have to make one move with my cutter because I'll drop it down. I'll do the forward cut. And then all I'll do is open my cutters and I'll slide it to the front. I'll angle it to the front and I'll make my second cut to bring that V chunk of material out so it doesn't bind. And the final cut we'll make is horizontally on the lower A post here. Now I talk about using cutters for these. You can also use any type of saw that will cut the metal. You know, most, most likely a sawzall will make these same cuts that the cutters did. One thing that I always like to look when you remove, when the doors are removed and you remove some of the bodywork, where are the holes that are already in that A post? There's holes to pass electric through. Uh, sometimes it's just the way the body is stamped that there will be holes. Use those to your advantage. Any hole that exists is material you do not have to cut. So look at, look at how the structure is shaped and stamped and use what that structure gives you. So we see here, we're cutting the A post, the double cut up at the A pillar. See this in the front structure, do the double cut or the V cut. And see, they're using this hole that already exists in the structure. So they're making the cut here, so they don't have to cut. If they cut up here in front, where they're cutting more metal than they actually need to. They'll use this hole and then they'll come back and use this hole. It gives you a little better bite on the spread cutters that they can get in a little deeper because it's not wrapping around all this material. And it's quicker since you don't have to cut all this extra material. And then down here, low cut in the fire and that A post all the way up, you'll cut. Usually I end up making two cuts one coming in from the door side, and then I'll come around where the with the fender removed, I'll come up under to get some of the front of the firewall. When I make my cut, I'll come in 90 degrees to the A post from the outside and put one of my blades in into the cut I just made and wrap it as far out as I can around the front firewall and make that cut. This is one of those things that making two cuts with the cutters just because I have a limited amount of opening with the cutters. With a Sawzall, it's nice that you can just do one big continuous cut without having to pause and reposition since it, you can, you know, there is no limitation on how far you can cut with a Sawzall. So sometimes, you know, saws are just as good or better in some applications than the heavy hydraulics. 
So now we go to spread. If you look, the spreaders go right in that cut that was made, that horizontal cut. This is the reason it is also very important that we try to keep that cut as flat as possible. So it's a nice base to put the spreaders in to be able to do the lift. You also notice here, we have the cut where they cut out the section of the fender support here. Now, one thing I like about these two pictures, you can see this picture here, they didn't put cribbing underneath the lower part of the A post. So when they pushed, this section of the rocker panel and A post pushed down. And it pushed down, so you got more that came down than you did that went up. So this was kind of ineffective. Here, you see we have good cribbing underneath it. So this, when we actually spread this, this did not move. All the force went into pushing the dash upwards. So you can see there is a lot, the dash went up almost, you know, almost a meter on this car but you'll see and this is where so the cutter person if they're aware as it started to come up it started to bring a wire harness up so the person with the cutters could come in real quick cut the wire harness and it gets it out of our way you see over here if i can get the video to play the spreaders notice how because of the way the cut was the spreaders came off at an angle they're not getting as much spread and the nice thing about using the dash lift once it's the dash is displaced away from the patient the tool is not in the way to get the patient out and often if you take the tool out the dash doesn't come back down as much as it does on a dash roll um, so those are kind of the, that's why we use the dash lift a lot more than we use the dash roll. So if we do what we call a dash roll, kind of the same things hold true. We have to make our cuts and the A post and the structure, but now we're going to move where we, um, where we make our bottom A post cut, and it'll be more of a diagonal cut at the bottom between the A post and the rocker panel. Since the dash, instead of going up, it's going to go forward and it's going to roll forward and off of the patient. So in this one, you'll notice the cut is the, vert is the vertical like we had in the dash lift what happened here uh, the scenario was the dash lift was ineffective we couldn't get it to work so we had to change our tactics that's why this isn't the optimal cut that we would have made but as you can see you push put the ram up against the b post and then you put the ram up against the a post right where it starts to curve up towards the roof and then you spread it apart now, a couple things to note. Once this spread's done, the tool's in the way of the patient. So you have to put some type of cribbing, wedges, or four by fours in this gap when you take the tool out so this doesn't come back together and the dash rolls back of the patient. The debt, this is still intact. So you want to make sure, like if you did a full side removal, it would be difficult to do this since there would only be a small portion of the B post remaining from at where you spread the B post away with the front door. One thing I would do a little different here to help prevent, especially on cars that, you know, we have Ohio, we have a lot of rust, we have a lot of corrosion. So sometimes this isn't supported very well. I would put more cribbing down in this area 
so that the load from the ram would be going more down into the ground and supporting this post, this uh, rocker panel. So you can use spreaders and come-alongs or high lift jacks and rams to get the steering column and dash up if you need, if you don't have the heavy hydraulic tools. On this, we used a four, there was a, they used a four by four across the windshield. They put a high lift jack with a chain. That chain is in wrapped as an X underneath um, underneath the steering wheel to kind of cradle the steering wheel. And then that jack is used to bring this, lift the steering wheel up off of the patient. Um, you can use the same thing with a come along and some cribbing. But just make sure that you get an X here under the steering wheel and then use some cribbing to get some, if you're using the come along, you need is cribbing to pick up the chain from, you know, so it's pulling kind of up on the steering wheel as opposed to flat. And I kind of have that laid out here that if we were using a come along to do a steering column lift on this car, we would connect to the dump, bumper here, install the come along, use some cribbing to elevate the chain, wrap the chain here around the steering wheel, and then use the come along to shorten the chain, which would pull the steering wheel up off of our patient. Sometimes if you're having issues or you don't have the tools that you can use to pop the doors or it's difficult to pop the doors, one way around that is to take the roof off. You can use circular saws, sawzalls, air chisels to remove a roof. And then you have total access from the patient to the patient from above. So it's fairly simple. You can cut every post and then just pick the roof directly off. Uh, if you don't want to take or you don't have the manpower to pull the whole roof, like on this car, if we did a cut at the A post, cut at the B post, and then cut right behind the B post into the roof, that gives us the ability to pull and hinge back the roof so we don't do a full removal. That would be similar to what was done here on this van. It would be really impractical to cut the entire roof off of this van. So what was done was they cut the A post, they cut the roof right behind, right in front of the B post so that it would, would lose its some of its structure and then flopped it directly back. On this car, we cut the sides off, the A, B, and C off of one side, and then the A and B, off, A and C off the opposite side, letting it, letting the roof connected to the B post, and then we pivoted it, pivoted the roof over to the side. This we cut all the pillars off, and we're picking the roof off to remove it totally away from the patient. So those are some options if you have a heavily entrapped patient that it might be easier to get to them if the roof is not in the way. Um, or it may be a case where you don't have the ability to get the doors off the car, but you can take the roof off the car. So those are just a couple things to think about there. Sometimes we don't have access to the roof. We don't have access to the sides of the car. The only way we have to get to the car is through the trunk. We call this tunneling. So what we do when we tunnel, we have to pop open the trunk, cut the trunk off, and then as you see here, the trunk's cut off, then we cut off the package shelf, remove the rear seats, and then we have access to the front compartment. Now in this case, to get the, da to get the dash off of the patient, we're able to use our spreaders or we could use any like bottle jacks or anything that we could fit in here, placed up under the dash and the center console. And then we open that up to give us the room that we needed. You know, one thing about lifting the dash, you know, we see the videos and we always do it in training that we have these huge openings. You know, I've, we picked up dashes three meters. When we're doing an actual extrication, we only need to bring it up just enough 
to be able to get the victim out. So we don't necessarily need to, you know, maybe if we move it, you know, 25 millimeters, that's all we need to be able to get the patient out. So think about what we need to move to get remove the patient and then use your tactics accordingly. So as we're coming through from a tunneling, one of the things we need to do to get a front seat patient out is to cut the seats so that we're able to lay the seat back and slide a backboard under them and pull them out through the back. Remember, there can be airbags in the seats, so we want to look at, you know, look at cylinders that may be in the air, in the frame of the car, frame of the seat, so we do not cut them. Um, this video is really good on cutting the seats. Um, it's a little old. It's actually about 16 years old, but it still is really good as far as going over the basics. And unfortunately, there's some cheesy music going. Really. Cutting the passenger seat back. Seat back is utilized to fold the seat back down to aid in patient removal. Cutting the passenger seat back is utilized to fold the seat back down to aid in patient removal in the event the release mechanism is inaccessible or damaged. In this video, we'll expose the release mechanism and review cutting options. You normally will be able to make your cuts without the removal of the outer cover of the seat. And you However, can see, we, have you know, we need to remove the outer purposes. cover of the seat now because of the potential for uh, cylinders, but also As the just mechanism area is exposed, view. you can see the structures that we are dealing with. We see the pivot pin, the heavy gauge steel at the base of the mechanism, and bolts. You should try to avoid the reinforced areas and cut the support that comes up into the seat back. This is the weakest point and cutting it will allow the seat back to fold down. We must maintain control of the patient during this tactic. One thing to deal with with the uh, reclining seats is first off try to find the mechanism find the mechanism side release it if it releases and the seat back goes back great but a lot of times during the wreck those get jammed so if you have to cut it try to go to the mechanism side first and the reason we do that is nine out of ten times the other hinge is just a dummy hinge cut the mechanism side the seat back will fold back but a couple things you gotta you gotta look for on the uh, on the seat mechanism the rolled steel right in there is a real strong piece uh, that we don't really want to cut through because what will happen is once your cutters get on that as you close your cutter tips will start to separate and once they start to separate if you keep going you're going to shear possibly shear a tip off so instead of cutting through that all we need to do is expose it or know where it is go above it to where the hinge is <clears throat> and cut through that area right there that's the least amount of metal we cut that, the mechanism doesn't matter anymore because we're cutting the seat away from the mechanism. Cut that side, the seat back should recline. If it doesn't recline, then that's telling us that the other uh, hinge is a is a uh, actual hinge that holds the seat up as well, and we have to cut it. Always know where your rescue tool is in relation to the patient, and remember, no more than one way to accomplish your extrication goals. So, you know, that's some good information there uh, as far as getting the seats, seats out. Um, I know we're right about at an hour now. So, you know, there's a lot more information we have. You know, the one things to look at like on vehicles on the sides and vehicles on the roof, you can use a lot of the same tactics. The big difference will be looking at how we're going to stabilize the cars. Yeah. 
So a vehicle on the side stabilization, we just wanna go through this real quick since we're at an hour, but just so, since this is important before you do anything, on the side, we wanna make sure we use what we call some struts so that we can aim high and catch the top of the car for the load so that the car doesn't roll. Uh, usually it's going to roll away from the wheels. The wheels provide a pretty good base of support that it doesn't wanna roll back over to the wheels. It will always try to wanna roll over towards the roof of the car. So that's where we wanna to try to stabilize and put our stabilization. And a strut can be as simple as wedging a four by four in the side and then tying it back somewhere low on the vehicle. We wanna make sure that strut is high up on the car. Otherwise, we can still roll over our stabilization. So that's why we wanna go as high as possible on a solid structure of the car. One of the big things is to think ahead when you're putting this stabilization in place so you don't end up getting in the way of what the extrication tactics you want, you want to use. So that's the real big difference on a side seated vehicle compared to one on its wheels is how we're going to stabilize it, stabilize its critical so that we don't end up having the car roll over on us. And with the car on its side and on its roof, another consideration is if the patients were not seat belted, they're all going to be flopped around in the car and laying at the lowest point of the car. So that's going to impact the tactics and how we assess our patients and actually have access to them. So with that, since we're at an hour, We'll go ahead and throw it back over to Jose so that he can talk us through uh, what we're going to do for tea time now. Wow, Ed, Ed, Woo, that is heavy information, my brother. <laughs> oh my gosh, I, I do want you to stop. <laughs> Oh, well, may, maybe we can have another class. Maybe we can find another week that we can do some more stuff with it, too. Absolutely. I, I think we, we might need to give you more time next time. Uh, you can take us, you can continue with the class. It's really, really uh, heavy and good. I love it. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you so much for staying with us and uh, listening through with Ed. You've seen how much it takes and all this is because of the safety of the, of the patient, you know. As you cut the A post, the B post and the C post and uh, everything else that we've been told, the most important person to, to keep safe is the patient. And uh, uh, it's a learning curve. It might be really a challenge right now because maybe we don't have the tools, but even as we have the, what we, we have, like the spreaders, um, the come along tools that we usually have in our, in, in our service, uh, not service centers, but our uh, fire stations, we can um, get to, to use them. So thank you so much, Ed. We look forward to having you uh, in the next uh, class. Maybe